Welcome, Starling Realty. Ernesto here. Today, we're going to cover legal and ethical compliance, how to keep your business out of trouble right now. And welcome back, Starling Realty. Ernesto here. Let's get into this. We've got uh, real estate legal and ethical compliance, how to keep your real estate business out of trouble with me, Broker Ernesto. I got some notes here. Let's get right into it, guys. So there are two governing bodies that um, that manage our real estate industry. There is Florida, Chapter 475, DBPR, FREC, Division of Real Estate, all of that. They handle your pre-licensing, they handle your post-licensing, they handle your continuing education, and they handle your legal complaints, okay? Then we have the National Association of Realtors, which is, of course, the Board of Realtors. That is not Florida law. Don't get them confused. It's not the same thing. National Association covers multiple listing service, ethics, as well as ethics complaints, association designations, all of that. So keep those two things in mind. You're going to need to do your four-hour ethics um, course every four years through the National Association of Realtors. You're going to do your orientation and your um, MLS uh, entry class, two and a half hours, through the association, but you're gonna do your 45 hour post and you're gonna do your 14 hour continuing education through the state. So keep that in mind. That's it for the slide, pretty easy. Let's get into the next one. So we have new construction and the practice of law. You might've heard me say many times, you cannot practice law outside of the framework provided to us by the, Nash, by the um, Florida Realtors. Okay, Florida Realtors creates our forms. There's hundreds of them. And we're allowed to essentially practice law within the framework of those forms. We are not allowed to practice law outside of the framework of those forms, such as builder contracts. So builder contracts are something else. Here's what we're, we're gonna talk about this right now. Builder contracts versus the Florida as is. The Florida as is and the, all the Florida, Florida bar contracts are created by the Florida realtors, Florida realtors. And so what they do is they create the forms we use them, right? So within that framework, we're allowed to practice law. We're not allowed to practice law where the builder contracts are. So anytime you have a builder contract, that means that you basically, if a customer says, can you tell me what this means? It's, it's tricky. It's questionable. You can help them read it, but you cannot give them legal advice. Never, ever, ever can we give somebody legal advice because we don't have the license and we break the law in doing so. So at Starlink, we created this form called the Statement Regarding Real Estate and the Practice of Law. I'm gonna go ahead and read this out so you can actually hear me say it. It says, please be advised that real estate professionals, including title and lending, are not permitted to provide legal advice in any capacity outside of the contract framework provided by the state. It is strongly recommended that you seek the assistance of a licensed legal professional attorney to help you make sound legal decisions in this transaction. When do we use that? We use this, this form is included in all of your dot loop files. When you open up a file in dot loop, this form will automatically be in there. Why? Because we recognize that at any point <clears throat> in a transaction, the transaction can go sideways and you need the help of an attorney. As soon as you need that, here's your form, it's ready made, you present it to them, they sign it and you are clear. So let's talk a little bit about builder contracts. Think about this for a minute. Builder contracts are usually 50, I've seen them 80 pages long, and the, the builder company will hire an attorney to create a document on their behalf. So who do you think it's gonna be kind of leaning towards? Do you think it's gonna be an equally a balanced contract or do you think it's gonna be weighed in the favor of the seller, i.e. the builder? Well, if you chose B, <laughs> you're correct. It's very much weighed towards the seller, i.e. the builder. Therefore, if we engage with that contract, number one, we're practicing law. Number two, we're working outside of our framework. So when it comes to builder contracts, we cannot give advice. And I know that's harsh to hear, but that is the truth. Anything outside of the Florida as is, or the Florida bar, or any of the Florida forms is outside of our field of work, okay? When that happens, we have a ready-made form for you to use and get with your customer and help him or her understand that they need the advice of a, of a licensed attorney or legal professional in the state, okay? Basically, when, when, when an agent says, hey, Ernesto, I've got this builder contract, can you help me look at it? Sure, we can look at it together. The one thing I'm gonna look at is I'm gonna make sure 
that the commission verification is in the contract because I want to make sure that our agent is being paid for that transaction. Okay, that's all that I'm going to look at. I'm going to be able to see the entire contract. I'll be able to understand most of it, but I won't be able to give you legal advice and I won't be able to give your client legal advice and neither will you. That's just the way it works. Okay, so um, everything on this page is taken care of. Let's get on to the next one. What do we got here? We got contracts. So tending to the contract. I got some notes here that kind of help out a little bit. Tending to the contract. What do we mean by that? Tending to the contract means that you have to, you've got usually three days to deliver escrow. So keep that in mind. You've got an inspection period, which is negotiable. It usually is about 15 days, but it can be less. It can be more. So keep an eye on that. And the finance contingency period is another date in the contract as well as the effective date. All these things are part of the contract. You hear me say many, many times, chess, not checkers. The contract is the number one document where we understand these items and we kind of put them together, okay? Finance contingency, inspection period, <clears throat> escrow deposit, closing date, all these things matter because if you violate any of those dates, you're in trouble, you have to negotiate and, and, and you lose essentially control, partial control of the transaction. Respecting the dates, what do we mean by that? Respecting the dates means that most of the time, at least in the as-is contract that is specified there, that the days that are being counted are calendar days. Calendar days, not business days. But there's a caveat with that. If the last day of any particular period, let's, for example, take the inspection period. Okay, you've got 15 days inspection. The last day of inspection period falls on a Saturday that Saturday will be extended to that Monday, if Monday is not a holiday, will be extended to Monday at 5 p.m. So you have an automatic extension built in via the contract if the last day of any time period ends on a holiday or a weekend, okay? Keep that in mind, very, very important. Closing delays. We have extensions, we have addenda, we have negotiations. When you have a delay in closing, it could come from anywhere, it could be it could be force au majeure, could be a hurricane in the area and they're not issuing insurance policies, so you have to extend. It could be that the builder hasn't finished building the house yet, so you have to extend. I have conversations with people where we've had extension after extension after extension. One month, one month, third month. So you're looking at 90 days to extend. It's always negotiable. So when you have a buyer or a seller for whatever reason, they can't come together on the dates, one side is gonna usually get frustrated before the other side and always think about negotiating that process, okay? So if someone says, I need an extension, I need it for 25 days, can you please, here, here it is, it's signed by the buyer, could you please have your seller sign it? The seller might be irritated with that. That doesn't mean the deal's dead. That might mean that you might have to negotiate that extension. Sometimes extensions can cost money and you can say, hey, we'll give, you, give us an extension for 20 days, we'll pay you 500 bucks, we'll pay you $1,000, we'll pay you $50 a day, $25, whatever. It doesn't really matter as long as you understand the fact that you can negotiate those things and kind of move forward. Rebates and contributions, what do we mean by that? What are we talking about? Two entities you can give rebates and contributions to. You can give them to your customer legally at the closing, on that very same closing, or you can give them to another licensed agent. If the other side, you're not allowed to give a commission or a finder's fee or anything like that in excess of $50 to anyone who isn't licensed in, in any state. So it's not necessarily uh, locked into Florida, but as long as they don't have a license, they're not, you're not allowed to pay them, okay? Because that's, that's um, uh, license law. Moving on from that, um, oh, one more thing. If you do a contribution to your buyer or seller at the closing, the title agent is going to require a letter of authorization from your broker. That will happen through here, it'll happen through the front desk and we'll help you with that letter. It'll have my signature on it, give it to the title agent, you're good to go. Super easy, okay? Post closing issues, the last one here on this page. All right, so this can be a problem. Generally, when you are contacted by either party after a closing, it's because of a problem. Sometimes that problem can be a legal problem. Excuse me for a sec. If you take a call, take the call from your client. Don't take the call from the other side. Remember, the other side, if you have the buyer side and you get a call from the seller, the seller themselves, they never hired you. You don't owe them an explanation. They should be talking to their agent. They should be talking to their agent's broker if necessary. They shouldn't be talking to you. Okay, so if you have a situation like that where you have a closing and then the opposite party is calling you to complain or to whatever they wanna talk about, 
they never hired you. So you let them know politely, look, reach out to your agent and let your agent reach out to me and my broker. This is the proper protocol on how to handle that, okay? If your own customer calls you, here's the other side of my notes here, if your own customer calls you and says, hey, we bought this house uh, a month ago and I didn't realize it's flooding, so um, somebody kind of uh, goofed up on their disclosures and I'm gonna be talking to my lawyer, so I need to let you know that this is happening. Immediately let the brokerage know, let me, our staff, front desk, whoever, let us know that we have that going on and we will address that from our side, from our agency, the people that hired us, we will engage. The other folks, we will not. So keep that in mind, okay? Let's go to the next page. We got some disclosures to talk about. Where are we here? So, there are different types of disclosures in our business. We have seller disclosures, affiliated disclosures, we have agency disclosures, which is also part of another, another class that we have, we have family slash owner disclosures, and then we have realtor disclosures. Let's go over, what are they? What, are they? what does that mean? So the seller disclosure is the five page report that the seller fills out when they give you a listing, right? I want you guys to hand that to your seller. I want the seller to fill it out and hand it back to you. I do not want you to walk around the house where the seller points out all the problems in the home. That means your liability is going right through the roof. Don't do that, okay? Hand over the five page document, take it back, that document itself then becomes your disclosure items. Because remember, you are bound to disclose known material facts about the home, just like the seller is. So if you know about a fact that can harm the value of the home, you have a duty to disclose it, okay? So I don't want you walking around the house discovering every little minute detail about the home because now you're giving yourself a ton of work to disclose every single item you know. Remember, if you don't know about it, it's not a disclosable item. Keep that in mind. So that's for seller disclosures. Affiliated disclosures, here's a totally different topic. So here at Starlink, we have Starlink Realty, we have Sandbar Title, and we just recently launched Pathway Mortgages, right? So we have a three-way company. We're looking into insurance in the future. As our customers go from our, realtor, from our real estate company to our mortgage company, to our title company, and beyond, they have to have something called an affiliated disclosure, which means, hey, our companies are working together. Here's this one, here's this one, here's this one. Please sign that you approve of our companies working together or being owned partially by the same folks. And then we're golden, okay? Agency disclosures. Now, this is also a portion of real estate that we cover in another class, Real Estate 101. This is part of Real Estate 101. Um, agency disclosures. What do we mean by that? Single agency, transaction broker, no brokerage relationship. That's what those are. You don't always have to disclose if you're working as a transaction broker, which is always recommended, okay? We're gonna talk a little bit more about this under the, the other portion of the program, which is the Real Estate 101, where we actually talk about disclosures. We're not gonna go over every little minute detail in this particular format because we will be here all day. <laughs> so um, one thing I wanna share with you guys really quick. This, is a, this, is, this class here is put together through years of dealing with issues and problems and solutions at the same time. It by no mean, by no means is the entirety of what can happen legally and ethically in your business, okay? It is a tool, it is a living document, if you will. If we do this exercise again in a year, perhaps in two or three years, we would be adding a bunch of components into this because things change, things evolve, something you learn today is different tomorrow, things like that. Plus, we can't cover every single item because it's not possible to do that. So keep that in mind. We're going over the basics and I'm giving you guys some tools to work with, basically what you need to know. But when it comes to these topics, there is an enormous amount of information behind the material. But the question becomes, what do you need to know as an agent? What do you need to understand as an agent? How do you best guide somebody that asks you the question? And the answers are in this program. So basically when someone says, hey, Ernesto, can you help me figure this out? Yes, I can. However, I cannot give you legal advice, but I can guide you to where you need to go to find it. Hey, Ernesto, what's up with permits? Okay, well, we can talk about permits, but I can't make you any promises about permits because there's a huge range of possibilities that can happen as a result of a, of a um, in insufficient permit or an open permit. Those are all kind of different things. The question becomes, what do you need to know to answer the question efficiently, effectively as a professional without really engaging into the material because it's not your wheelhouse? So keep that in mind, okay? Um, where were we? F agency disclosures, we talked about that. Uh, family owner disclosures, okay? Seller is licensed real estate agent. 
or seller is related to a license to the licensed real estate agent. In other words, if you're listing a home for a family member, you have to disclose on confidential comments in the MLS, seller is related to real estate agent. So that when a member, Freck and Florida, chapter four, they all they all want you to not harm or deceive the public. So always think about that. Always keep that in your in your in the forefront of your mind because as long as you're taking good care of the public and you're and you're disclosing to them, you're fine. The minute you forget or the minute you fail to do a disclosure to the public, you got a problem. So keep that in mind. Okay. Seller is licensed real estate agent. If you're selling your home, you have to put that disclosure into the MLS. Seller is a licensed real estate agent. Seller is licensed real estate agent. Seller is related to licensed real estate agent. So either the seller is related to the agent or the seller is the agent. Both disclosures are necessary if you, depending on which one, of course, if you are the seller, you have to say that you're licensed. If you're working with a customer who's a family member, you have to say is related to. So seller is related to real estate agent. Always be disclosing those items, okay? Um, last one here at the bottom, realtor disclosures. What do we mean by that? When I was brand new in the industry, I walked into a FISBO and I forgot to tell the lady that was there that I was a licensed agent. And within an hour or two, my broker got a call saying I failed to disclose. Um, I, I believe her, <laughs> her son was a lawyer and um, I got my ear chewed off because of that. It was a mistake. I forgot to disclose. The minute I made my first contact with this for sale by owner, I did not say, these are my customers. I'm a licensed agent. That was my failure. You have to disclose your realtor status in an unknown environment, right? So if you're walking into a for sale by owner, if you're initiating a conversation with someone who is a seller, don't, don't assume that they know you're licensed. Let them know. That's realtor disclosures, okay? Easy stuff here, guys. I just wanna give you some tips to kind of move forward, all right? Let's go to the next slide. We're cruising through this. This is awesome. What do we got? We got showings. All right. A couple tips about showings. Drive separately from your buyers. That decreases your liability, okay? In this town where we have a huge number of snowbirds and they don't drive that well, you have people in the car with you. Your insurance is high. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, in a, it's in a more risky place than if you drive separately from them and you meet them there. There is no real reason. Some people have told me before that, you know, Ernesto, I do a lot of my selling while we're in the car and that's fine. Just remember that as you're doing that, you also are elevating your risk, okay? You're not necessarily giving yourself a raise because the closing is gonna generate the same amount of dollars for you, but you are increasing the liability. So as a business owner, which you are, all of you guys are business owners, you have to remember, you should always consider your income against your risk. It's what we do in business, okay? My risk is here, my income is here, is it worth it? Is it worth it for me to take these people myself, try and do a little selling in the car, take the risk that somebody's gonna rear end me or fender bender or whatever, next thing I know, my insurance policy is uh, decimated and I've got, I've got some financial issues as a result. So keep that in mind. We're not saying not to, we're just saying kind of watch out for that, okay? Opening and closing your listings. Leave the place as you found it or better, okay? Check uh, locks, lights, sliding doors, etc. Supra and combo box. Do not share the combo code. Happens all the time. If you share it, you're gonna end up talking to the board and you may get a fine. Or worse, they could steal something and then it's a bigger problem where they can come after your license. Do not share that, that code on a combo box and do not show without confirmation. Remember, as soon as you click that Supra with your phone, it opens up, it sends an email to the listing agent. If you didn't have a, a um, confirmation on your showing, the broker will get a call and you'll get a call from the association, might have a fine, okay? So it's happened before, don't let it happen to you. COVID-19, yay, okay. Um, <laughs> respect the homeowner and the tenant's uh, space as they wish to have it for themselves. If the tenant, if the seller tell you they want you guys to wear a mask, wear the mask. If they request uh, for you to wear them, you know, you and your buyers, just go ahead and wear them. It's their space. They don't have to let you in. Um, ten, you know, had this conversation recently. A tenant does not have to allow a showing. They, they own the bundle of rights, including the right of quiet enjoyment for that space in the rental contract. So if they don't want people to go through the house and see it, 
they don't have to. It's a tough rule, but it is the truth. Keep that in mind, okay? Let's move on. Next one here. You're going to love this one. Here we go. Escrow and more. Three things to talk about escrow. Deposit, release, and then disputes, right? Because disputes lead to other places. So what are we, what are we we're talking about deposit? We're talking about being on time. Receipt must be delivered to the listing agent on time. Usually you have three days to do that. So escrow, you have three days to submit escrow. You also have three days to submit the receipt that the escrow was in place to the listing agent. Okay, so want to make sure you know that. If you don't do that, you're violating FREC law. That's how they have it. Release of escrow. How does escrow get released? Escrow gets released when both buyer and seller, everyone who signed on the contract must also sign the release of escrow, giving instructions to the title agent on what to do with that escrow. The escrow can be split. It can be given back to the buyer in its entirety. It can be given back or can be given awarded to the seller in its entirety. Nothing will happen unless everyone signs the escrow release. If you don't have a signature on the escrow release, the title agent is bound to not release that escrow. Okay. And what, what happens when that happens? You have an escrow dispute. An escrow dispute gets elevated from an escrow dispute where you can actually negotiate the process. Hey, we got 10,000 in escrow. The buyer says that, that he's entitled to it. The seller says that she's entitled to it. So based on the contract, we can give a pretty decent analysis of who's more likely to win that escrow. Remember, nothing happens until the signatures are in place. But if no one wants to sign or if one person fails to sign, then the elevation process begins to happen. We go from an escrow dispute, we go into mediation. Remember, the agents can negotiate mediation. We can be, we can be the initial portion of mediation, meaning that we can say, okay, um, the buyer would like to receive the entire escrow. The seller says, no, no, my property has been off the market for seven weeks. And I, during the you know biggest sale period of the, of the year, so I'm not going to release escrow. I'm going to keep escrow. And so, so the buyer wants the whole thing and the seller wants the whole thing. Maybe the agents can come together and say, how about this? We understand that the seller has had their property off the market for a long time. We understand that the, that's a lot of escrow. So we understand the buyer wants some of it back. Let's split it. You can split it any way you want or any way that they agree. 70-30, 90-10, 10-90, 50-50, 60 -40, however you guys want to do it. As long as you can negotiate, you're good to go. When that negotiation slash mediation falls apart and you're still stuck and the escrow is not released in real estate, our hands off, we go into arbitration, which is basically the, the board. I'm sorry, take that back. It's not the board. It's the law. It's the court. Okay, so as soon as we get into arbitration, both parties are going to have to talk to their attorney. Realtors are hands off and we move on. Not We don't really move on. We just kind of sit back and watch what happens in the court. We watch what happens in arbitration. The court order will arrive at some point saying buyer gets it, seller gets that, and it's a done deal. A lot of times the title agent will have to release escrow to the court. And at that point, the title or rather the, um, the escrow becomes part of the court and the court decides what to do with it. The one thing to remember about mediation slash arbitration is that in mediation, you can negotiate, okay? There's there's an element of both buyer and seller. They can agree, they don't have to agree if, you know, signature, no signature, whatever. Arbitration is done for you. So when arbitration happens, the court decides. They might say, um, seller gets the escrow. Done, nobody can say or do anything about it. It's done, gavel goes down, it's over, right? So that's the difference between arbitration and mediation where you can actually negotiate the mediation part there's there's a, a process of mediation that happens also at the um at the court as well with professional mediators in place one one thing that i'll share with you about moving from mediation into arbitration is that whatever was negotiated in mediation that did not work does not convey into the arbitration arbitration case if that makes sense let's say that um during mediation, the buyer makes an offer to the seller. Look, we'll give you, we'll give you twenty five hundred dollars out of the ten thousand dollar escrow. We'll give you that, and then we'll keep seventy five hundred. That's an offer. The buyer made that offer to the seller. The seller declines, and they don't make a deal. Okay, that offer does not convey into the arbitration case. They start over fresh. Does that make sense? Don't worry too much about it. Anyways, that's plenty of um, of material to go over for this one. Escrow and more. Let's go to the next one. Rentals, get ready for fun. Look at the look at the notes on this one. Whew, lots of notes. Okay, so under rentals, rentals by the way is one of the most legally heavy 
transactions that you can do. There's a ton of legality here and a ton of reasons to get in trouble and a ton of reasons to get someone sued. So pay attention for this slide. We got a lot of work to do on this one, okay? Private info and background search. Nowadays, when somebody wants to apply for a rental, they have to get their background search. They, uh, smart um, homeowners and landlords will do a background check on everyone. And there are, there are ways to do a background check that does not involve the exchange of personal information between the customer slash would-be tenant and the agent, which is exactly what you want. You do not want to grab any personal information because at some point in the future, you can be blamed for certain types of identity theft, okay? So if you don't receive any personal information, you can never be, you can never be challenged on that. So there's lots of websites that will, you'll be able to enter your listing onto the website and then your customer, you give them the link and the customer will self, how do we do this? They will self identify with the website. Basically the website will say, is your name Mary Smith? My name is Mary Smith and my address is this. And then the website will start asking questions like, did you ever live at 123 Main Street? Did you ever drive a Nissan Sentra? Did you ever, did you ever, did you ever? So the person will self verify their identity, right? And it's a pretty cool system because it's almost fail proof. It, it, it knows background information about the person who they say they are. And if they can verify those things, then the system will verify them for you. And so then you get a report of them without any of the personal information in the report, right? So you hand that report over to the landlord. The landlord decides what he or she's going to do with that report in terms of allowing these people to rent or moving on to someone else. Ideally, your hands are clean of any type of personal information and that is very, very important. Okay, so um, use, for example, I use a website called tenantbackgroundsearch.com. So write that one down if you want to. There's many, many others that work really well. For about $30, you can do a full background search on somebody, which includes uh, criminal, includes rental, includes um, credit check and that kind of thing. So remember, you are not going to do anything with the information except pass it over to the landlord and the landlord will make a decision. You don't make decisions. Okay, we're gonna get to that in a little bit further here in a second. So you can also Google for other websites, like um, you can Google for background checks, um, Florida or whatever town you live in, and you're gonna get a whole list of different, a variety of different websites with a variety of costs about how they work. Okay, so keep that in mind. We've got short-term and vacation rentals. We do not process those until you have a conversation with us here at the front desk because they are a different item. They don't fall under traditional rentals. They don't fall under traditional sales or anything like that. Here at Starlink, if you wanna do short-term rentals, we need to have a conversation. There's a different fee structure for it and everything. It is also very legally heavy. There are taxes involved under short-term that um, are not, they're not uh, easily accessible. So there's a whole element of, of um, there's a whole kind of a different thing when it comes to short-term and vacation rental. So we're gonna leave that one there and move on. Security deposit, all right. So remember I said earlier, what do we need to know about these things? Okay, we could sit here and have a, a, a 30 hour uh, transaction here together where we, where we consider everything, but that's not really gonna help you. What's really gonna help you is what do you need to know about a particular topic, okay? When it comes to a security deposit, in my experience, I know that we have some people that are specialists in the field, and I would love to learn from you guys at some point. But from my experience, if there's a security deposit, which there usually is in a rental, and if it's in any way contested by the, by the uh, landlord or by the tenant, whatever, suggest an attorney. Stay out of it, suggest an attorney. It's not your deal. It's very, like I said earlier, rentals, security, it's very legally heavy. So the more you get in there trying to help, the more likely it is that you're gonna get in trouble. Okay, so keep that in mind. Tenant slash landlord, what, what did I put that there? What, what do we mean by that? So stay, here's what we mean by that. Stay in the, in the contract framework. Stay in the framework of the contract. The, the, le the uh, lease contract is roughly like, it's like 10 pages, um, but then it has another 11 or 12 pages of legally legal material on there. So as long as you stay within the contract, you're fine. You can negotiate, you can talk about every portion of the contract that you want. As soon as you have some other document, whether it's a contract, maybe it's a rental that's not part of the Florida Association and, and all of that, you have to suggest an attorney. If they have a problem which lies outside of the framework of that lease agreement, you have to suggest an attorney, okay? 
Because why? Because if you don't, you're practicing law outside of the framework, which is illegal. All right. Discrimination. Ooh. We were sued on this one before. And we were sued on this because someone called. Listen to this story. Someone called one of our agents. And believe it or not, it was a firm that was known for baiting uh, sort of uh, questions to different people. So f phone rings, agent answers, who has a, a rental listing? And the person on the line says, you know, um, I have had three, f what did you say? We've had, I have had three felony arrests in my, um, I have three felony arrests. Do you think that the landlord will rent to me? And the agent mistakenly said, well, that might be a problem. Lawsuit. Why? Because number one, arrests don't mean anything. Convictions do. But who's who's going to know that, right? So don't worry about that. The whole point is that do not answer a legal question. The way that question is answered is please submit your application and the landlord will consider you from there. You are not the purveyor of the answers to these questions okay somebody can ask you a million questions whether it's you know will you rent to me i have a service dog will you rent to me i'm from this country will you rent to me i'm this color absolutely submit your application and let's have the 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 tenant or rather the landlord come back to you okay you never give an opinion as to whether yay or nay qualify don't qualify that is not up to you that is up to a process that you're not um you're not a part of and the minute you involve yourself in that, you end up in a lawsuit and the brokers will end up in a lawsuit. So these are, and this is, I'm telling you something that has happened here before. And so we wanna learn from it, right? Um, don't get caught flat footed on this one. Remember, you don't make decisions and the landlord does. We'll go over that again. Please submit your application and the landlord will consider you from there. Have a nice day. Awesome stuff, right? Okay, we skipped over something. We skipped over section eight. Here we go, section eight. Section eight is a federally funded rental assistance program. Refer that to a specialist. We do have people here at Starlink that are specialists with, um, sort of specialists with uh, section eight. Section eight is a process, it's a legally, or rather it's a federally funded uh, rental assistance program. And it just, it has some tools. If you've never worked with it, refer it to somebody that knows. Don't assume you know how it works because you can get yourself in trouble, all right? There's a lot of legality in rentals and I think that covers us for this slide. I'm having a good time, guys. I hope you are too. And I hope you're learning things. Let's get over to the next slide. We're almost there. <clears throat> Marketing and branding. You already know this. Consistent, compelling content. But there's a few keys that you may or may not know that I want to share with you. Some of this material is newer. Um, let's look at, let's get on the same page here. Number one. FREC wants you to be transparent with the public, okay? So I wrote up here at the top of my notes, transparency with public, that's the number one priority, all, the, all this stuff here. So when it comes to branding, when it comes to marketing, if you're showing, if you're, if you're pushing a listing on social media, if you're sending out postcards, if you are um, making flyers, whatever you're doing, we're gonna take three of these together. The agent slash team promotion, the listing promotion, and social media, as well as print marketing, all of that, if you're promoting yourself as well as the brokerage, you must have the brokerage logo attached to there and it cannot be less size, like it has to be 50-50 with your team name. This is one of the newer rules that came out within two years, I think. So you can't just say, you know, um, so-and-so's brokerage team brokered by Starlink Realty. You can't actually say that, but they have to be equal in size. Back in the day, you could have your team real big up at the top and you could have brokered by Stalin Realty at the bottom and it could be smaller. Not anymore. Now it's 50-50, they have to show. And I can see why, because Freck, does, Freck wants full transparency with the public. You know what else tends to happen? I see it online all the time. Somebody promotes a listing, right? And they will put on their, on their, on the actual post, it'll say such and such listing, here's the address, here's how much it costs, it's a three, two, it's beautiful, blah, blah, blah. And then 10 lines down, it'll say the brokerage, Starlink Realty. But when it posts, it doesn't it doesn't show. So the post, you look at the post and unless you hit the see more button, you can't tell who's who brokers it in any of that. That is considered a violation 
by Freck because they see that as not full transparency with the public. So ideally, I know this is a big ask, but ideally you want to have all of your listings and all of your listing material, presentations, everything, your name, whether it's your name or a team name, as well as Stalin Realty fifth, splitting 50-50 of that space. Okay, so keep that in mind. We don't want anybody to get in trouble. Um, let's talk about, so that covers all the way down to print marketing, MLS. MLS has something new. It's about a year old. It's called clear cooperation policy. A lot of agents don't know what this means. What this means is that under clear cooperation policy, from the moment that you first initiate a public offering of a listing, you now have 24 hours to make that listing available on the MLS. 24 hours. It used it, they didn't care about it before, which was really great because if you had a, a list of buyers you could say, hey, I'm going to give this listing to my buyers for the first three days, let them look this over, give them an opportunity to work with my sellers first. And I thought it was a great, because coaches were coaching this and everything. And so the MLS comes out and says, no, no, you can't do that, you only have one day now. You have 24 hours. So feel free to enter your brand new listing in the Starling private forum, but you got 24 hours to put it on the MLS, okay? Even though it's private, it's considered a public social, uh, social post or whatever. And so then technically you'll have 24 hours to put it on the MLS. Makes sense, right? I don't like it, but it makes sense. Cool. Realtor or realtor, how do you spell that? Like, how do you do it? I wanna share with you guys how this is done. And I wrote some notes here. I wanna teach you guys some things about this too. Both of those are correct ways of spelling the word realtor. You can do it all caps or you can cap the first letter. You don't have to put the registered logo at the end. Um, I actually put it on here. I Googled how to do a, um, a registered mark on this keyboard that I have, which happens to be a Mac. It's different based on what computer you have, so I just Googled it and it tells me how to put the R on there. I actually didn't know how to put it up at the top. Um, so it's kind of in the, in the middle. Anyways, you don't have to put the registered mark on there, but you do have two ways of spelling the word realtor. Sorry, one way to spell it, but two ways to write it. Either the entire word has to be capped or just the R, okay? Um, also, when it comes to the word realtor, do not use the word realtor as a personal URL, email, social, etc. It is a registered word, so it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to the Realtor Association, and they don't like it when people use their word, which is unfortunate. Um, I think they could probably uh, allow us to, since we are members, but they don't. They don't allow us to use it. You, of course, are a realtor. You want to um, promote yourself as a realtor, but not your material, not your URL, not your email address, et cetera, et cetera, right? But you are, uh, like for example, in your business card, your name, realtor, because you are a realtor. That's fine. In fact, it's it's uh, recommended you should do that because you're a realtor, but not under social media and not under your um, URL, et cetera, okay? Let's go to the last one. We got one more to go and we're done, guys. Love it. Other items. These questions come up all the time. 1031 exchanges, RESPA, permits, FERPTA, trusts and corporations, probates and short sales. Let's get into these. Um, 1031 exchanges allow investors to defer capital gains tax on the sale of investment property, okay? As soon as somebody tells you that they're doing a 1031 exchange, refer them to a specialist. You cannot complete the 1031 exchange yourself. It's a, it's, a, it's a process that there are special companies designed to help people with those 1031 exchanges. You can get educated on Google if you want to, do 1031 exchanges, uh, YouTube, however you wanna do it. The whole point is that um, if you haven't done it before, don't take it upon yourself to learn everything about it. It's too much, you're not gonna be able to do it. So just give it to 1031 exchange um, specialty firm and they'll help you with that. You're still gonna make your commission. It has nothing to do with having a split or any or a referral or anything like that, okay? Keep that in mind. Um, RESPA, Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. Google that. And you're gonna find that the full RESPA document is roughly 67 pages, which we're not gonna go through in this document, but I do wanna make you aware of number one, what it is. Remember we talked about this earlier in today's in this class is I'm not trying to teach you every single little detail of everything. I'm trying to teach you enough to get by. And, and the question is, what do you need to know as a professional agent in the field? What do you need to know about RESPA? Well, you need to know what it is and you need to know that it was enacted by Congress 
to ensure home buyers and sellers are able to complete settlement disclosures. So it's all about disclosures, okay? Again, we can dive into this thing and spend three days going over it, or I can tell you essentially what it is, what it does. You'll have to essentially be a kind of respect it and move on from there. Let's talk about permits a little bit. Um, I think either yesterday or two days ago, we had a great conversation about this on our private forum on Facebook. When it comes to permits, people are going to ask you, do I need a permit to get a pool? Do I need a permit to, um, to repair my pool cage? Do I need a permit to change my toilet? Uh, you don't know. And don't pretend that, you know, don't make any promises when it comes to permits. A lot of people in this area will make uh, um, additions to the home. They'll put a kitchen in the back and they will do it without a permit, which can be a problem. It doesn't mean that it will be a problem, but it can be a problem. And you don't know whether it's going to become a big problem or it's going to stay little, right? So everything can happen in between. So when it comes to permits, allow the system to unfold without you making any promises regarding the permits, because honestly, you don't know. Something, something minor could become a huge problem and something that looks like it's a big hot mess could be nothing. So when it comes to permits, that's essentially the, the, the gist of it. So we're just gonna kind of move on from there. Let it, let it be from there. Do not make any promises when it comes to permits, okay? Easy enough. FERPTA, Foreign Investment in Real Property Tax Act. That's an easy one. Refer it to a FERPTA specialist, <laughs> just like just like the other one. You don't have to know everything about it. It is a it is a um, investment tax strategy for for um, people from out of the country, people who are not uh, people who aren't naturalized, etc. Live in other countries. It's there. It's available. It has a ton of rules and items stuck to it that we're not going to discuss because you don't need to know them. If you do have a FERPTA case, refer it to the right folks and don't make any promises, and then you're golden. All right. All right, trusts and corporations. What do we need to know about that? Trust and corporate, they can buy property, they can sell property. But trust and corporations, they cannot sign as a natural person. Okay, so you have to understand that if you have a seller or a buyer who is a corporation or a trust, you have to have a trustee person, human, to do the signature so that it actually is legal, right? It has to be a signatory, it can be part of the trust, it can be part of the corporation, it can be a president, vice president, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it has to be a person representing that firm. And that is all you need to know about that, okay? What about probates? What are they? Probates is essentially a legal process which verifies a will. Someone passed away and sometimes via the tenancy that they had with their spouse or maybe they didn't have a spouse or maybe they were already widowed and it goes to children and that kind of thing. Well. Sometimes there's a there's a will and sometimes there's not. There's all these different conditions and components that can play a role into the probate process. Understand that if you have a probate, it is a legal process that happens in the background. You're not really attached to it. You just have to wait. And it can be it can be six months, it can be a year. I've seen them take 10 months uh, to complete a probate. So that's all you need to know about it is that they take a long time, it's a legal process. And if some if you have a listing that is gonna require a probate, maybe it would be a smart thing to tell a buyer's agent, hey, this might take a while, it's a probate. If your buyers need to move in by the end of the month, this is not, this is not the one, okay? That kind of thing. Short sales. Uh, short sale is when a transaction, it's when a transaction closes, but there's not enough money to cover the note that's on there. So you've got a seller who's, who's got a note for $200,000. The market is allowing, or the market is, is um, is bringing $175,000 for that particular home to the table, but the seller has $200,000 that they owe to their bank, right? So the bank is gonna have to negotiate with that because the bank is gonna have to approve it. Once the bank approves it, the property will close at 175 and then the bank and the seller will have to figure out what to do with that 25K that's missing. Sometimes they forgive it, very often they do not, and that again creates a legal process. Um, I have experience with short sales. Our team here at Starlink and Sandbar, especially Vanessa is a pro. She, um, ha we have a ton of experience with short sales way back when, uh, 2008, when they were happening a lot. So if you have any questions about them, let us know. We've got your back, okay? And let's touch on this one more time as we wrap this up, you guys, I'm so excited. Um, do not provide legal advice, ever. That's easy. Don't do it. And that is it, you guys. I cannot wait. I'm really enjoying these videos. I hope you're getting a lot out of them as well. Um, I'm, I'm putting together, I've got here, I've got, um, 
the rest of Real Estate 101 right here. It's all laid out and I'm gonna be creating the videos for Real Estate 101 and we're gonna put it all together as a class that you'll be able to take at your, at your own speed. So the whole point is we wanna get you guys to learn things on your own time, when you need it, and that kind of thing. This class here, this is a legal class that I want you guys to know basically what we talked about today. It's not the end all be all of everything, um, it's the beginning. So I'm sure that this will be a living document that we have here that will continue to evolve and grow over time. And, um, and we're here to serve you guys and we're here to work with you and um, do well and elevate the industry. Uh, create great relationships in the uh, out there in the community and um, we're happy to be a part of your team. All right. I love you guys and I'll see you the next time. Bye.